Okay, so we've had presentations from James and Neil and Stanley, and now you folks are armed with all the information you need to refute the nonsense that's going on in the media when they talk about, oh, there's more severe weather due to climate change, hurricanes are greater than climate change, and all this stuff. So you've got the tools now. You know, we've said a couple of times during this conference that democracy dies in darkness, and so I'd like to amend that to say democracy dies in silence. If you folks don't speak up against this stuff with the tools that we've given you, then we're in that mode, we're in that democracy dies. So please speak up when you can, write letters to the editor, correct these falsehoods, and point out where they're making mistakes. Okay, we're gonna have question and answer now, about 10 minutes or so. Uh, come up to the microphone, or they'll bring the microphone to you, and you're gonna take the microphones out? Okay, they'll take the microphones to you, and um, uh, give your full name, and speak your question, and please speak it loudly because the speakers are pointing that direction and it makes it hard for us up here to hear. So our first question. Hi, I'm Kip Hansen. I'm with the CO2 Coalition. Um, question for our hurricane experts. Didn't Lancy just publish a paper this year that tries to correct the hurricane record for the missing hurricanes in the past record? Yeah. I, I, how do we turn this on, or is it on? It's, it's on. on? Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly which is the recent one, but he's been publishing lots of these. And uh, in fact, he has a, a blog on the 2020 season, similar to what Neil was talking about. Uh, but he does, has published stuff on the, the missing hurricanes, the short-lived hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera. He's one, listen, he's one of the big champions. We actually tried to get him for the conference here this year, but to get someone from the Hurricane Center during October, Neil, uh, for, for, forget that. And maybe someday he'll speak for himself in one of these conferences. Hi, my name is Bob Enlick. I'm with the Crucis Atmospheric Sciences Forum. And I've got a question for Stanley. Uh oh. When Hurricane Michael went into Tyndall Air Force Base, it was seemed like a category three to me. And NOAA later reanalyzed it and said it was a category five. I did my own analysis of this and I read the NOAA analysis. And they used flight level winds and mixed flight level winds offshore and said, well, those were the winds that struck Tyndall. There are winds at Tyndall, there are winds out in the ocean, there are a number of errors associated with the GPS location so of the winds that uh, we saw. I disagreed with it. What's your comment? First of all, I encourage you to email me uh, and I will get every quantitative thing you have to the National Hurricane Center uh, because they are constantly changing things. I was flying Hurricane Michael and uh, we uh, definitely, this thing was, you gotta realize when they say Cat 5, that means the max winds somewhere at landfall was category five. So you could be five miles from that max point and it's not category five, it's a very tight storm. So from what I've seen, I would tend to agree with them that it was Cat 5. When I flew it, it was just turning to Cat 4. Do you have anything, any comments since you worked with the Hurricane Center? Uh, but the Hurricane Center does their best with all this data and analyzing and analyzing it. By the way, Michael was one of only four Cat 5 storms to have hit the U.S. in the last hundred years. Uh, just a, a tidbit, all of those Cat 5 landfalls, those storms were tropical storms less than about 60 hours before landfall. They all revved up and rapidly intensified. A nightmare for forecasting. Thank you. But send me, send me everything you have. I'd be interested. But I would also add that these rapid intensity storms is not a new event. Right. 1935, the strongest storm that has hit the United States crossed the Florida Keys as a Category 5. It was a tropical storm on Andros Island in the western Bahamas 36 hours before that. Let me, let me, in fact, let me add to that. There was one of the papers recently published from my lab 
uh, one of the other divisions in our, in our building, and they talked about how the number of storms rapidly intensifying in the Atlantic had gone up by a factor of three now compared to, say, the 70s and 80s. And I went to him and said, well, that's the exact increase in the number of major hurricanes from low activity to high activity. And they're the ones that rapidly intensify. They're the main ones that rapidly intensify. So in other words, saying something was almost climate, but it was just simply the number of those major hurricanes that rapidly intensify. Before I, we, I, uh, please stand up. Thank you. Okay, Anthony. Before you ask your question and state your name, I'm going to tell everyone who this is. Charles. This man right here standing up in the back is Charles Rotter. Charles Rotter has been my right-hand man with What's Up With That for quite some time. He was instrumental in Climate Gate, and he keeps the presses running when I'm out traveling and doing <laughs> things like this. Let's have a big hand for Charles Rotter. All right, let's hear what you have to say. Um. I'm Charles Rotter. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with your uh, new title, Doctor, Dr. Goldenberg. Uh, your discussions of Andrew reminded me of something I witnessed, but I've never seen written up about. It's an anecdote that I'm just going to tell. I was uh, witnessed the Loma Prieta earthquake in San Francisco in 1989. Um, subsequently, there were damage estimates of three and a half billion, five billion, and it became the biggest, natural, most expensive natural disaster in United States history. Three years later, Andrew hit. They started reporting seven billion dollars. Our actuaries went back and started recalculating in California so that we could have a higher number. <laughs> And they, st they started uh, adding in the cost of the traffic delays on drivers' <laughs> pocketbooks and everything they could till they could get us above that Florida number. You know, the interesting thing with Andrew was the estimate was $25 billion. I think there was insurance damage or I forgot how they measure it. But if that storm, that exact same storm, had hit about 15 miles north, a cat's whisker, the damage they estimate might have been 80 billion right. because it hit the eye wall of that storm, hit the least populated area, right. the least money, the least number of people in all of Miami-Dade County. And if it had been 15, 20 miles north, it would have been downtown, the seaport, the hospitals, the airport, on and on and on. So uh, that was 25 was pretty low <laughs> for, right. for what happened. Got a, there we go. So glad you're here. Hi, I'm Rick Worma. I'm an occasional poster on what's up with that. One of the things I'd like to do sometime is write an essay, either for the blog or for my own web pages, <clears throat> listing my perception of the 10 most influential weather events in my lifetime. So this will exclude a lot of things, like I wasn't around for Hurricane Andrew. I wasn't around for um, Nor'easter in 1962 that wiped out my parents' house on Long Beach Island in New Jersey, but it was a really neat house, and boy, I re really remember that storm. One of the things I'm going to list is the 13-year hurricane pause. So extreme weather, everything we've talked to about here has been strong storms, but extreme weather can be completely benign <laughs> stuff. So 13 years with no major hurricanes hitting the United States or Florida is really a remarkable record and deserves some attention. That's true. Uh, I'll, I'll, right. I want to comment uh, on that. You know, I think oh. we've got time for just one more question. Oh. This gentleman here in the front row, right here, had his hand up a little bit ago. Yes. Uh, uh, Steve Wellstan from Northern California for Dr. Goldenberg. Uh, I'd like to know where, where your house was during Andrew, because I had a relative that rode through that. And then if you could just give us a, a, a thumbnail of uh, what are the measurements that are taken uh, during those aircraft flights in the, through the hurricanes. Thumbnail, oh goodness. Uh, first of all, I encourage you to look at the page, the uh, Hurricane Research Division, look it up online and you can follow what we do. Uh, and the Aircraft Operations Center from NOAA. But my house was located in Perrine area which was about 169th uh, Street 
by the way, the house is still a vacant lot. Uh, my in-laws owned it, and they bulldozed it, got their insurance money, sold the property, and nobody has built. And it's a middle neighborhood. It's a vacant lot. Uh, but uh, so it was, in, it was in the North Eye Wall. So it was in some of the max winds of Hurricane Andrew. But as far as the instruments, they keep adding. I mean, we've got the drops and sounds. We have AXBTs, which are measure the ocean uh, temperatures. We have microwave scatterometers. We have cloud physics, measuring the minute particles in the clouds, which tremendously affects how hurricanes work and how they develop. And we have uh, turbulence meters. And we, we actually, one of the most interesting newer instruments uh, is the uh, unmanned flights. So we have SON, what do they call them? The aerosons, uh, coyote, and Hurricane Michael, we flew it. So it's this little thing that goes out through the chute, the wings come out, goes down near the surface where we don't want to fly, and measures, I mean, they can steer this thing in Cat 5, Cat 3 hurricane winds. Amazing, looks like a little rubber band engine, and it sends the data back to the plane. And I, so we're always adding new instruments. It's fascinating, just follow the Hurricane uh, Research Division, you'll see a lot of what's going on. Thank you. Yeah, but your house is like five miles inland, right? Oh yeah, it was all it wind. It wasn't on the beach. It was, all, it was all wind damage. Most of the damage from Andrew was from wind. And I always remember something Neil said years ago. He flies these flights when he was director of the Hurricane Center after the storms. So he sees and surveys, and in Hurricane Camille, most of the damage was storm surge. It was 25 foot storm surge. But on the edge, there was some area that was strictly wind damage. And he told me, he said, that's what I saw in Andrew, that wind damage we had seen from Camille. And concrete block houses with a building code ripped Good apart, building. ripped apart. Wow. All right. Thanks very much, our distinguished panel, for giving all the answers today. All right. Lunch is served in the main ballroom. We'll see you there. Yeah, it goes by. Great, Great. job.